It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me, that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe? His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful! Great God! His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness. But these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set. His shriveled complexion and straight black lips. The different accidents of life are not so changeable as the feelings of human nature. I had worked hard for nearly two years for the sole purpose of infusing life into an inanimate body. For this I had deprived myself of rest and health. I had desired it with an ardor that far exceeded moderation. But now that I had finished, the beauty of the dream vanished and breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. Unable to endure the aspect of the being I had created, I rushed out of the room and threw myself on the bed in my clothes, endeavoring to seek a few moments of forgetfulness. By the dim and yellow light of the moon, as it forced its way through the window shutters, I beheld the wretch the miserable monster whom I had created. He held up the curtain of the bed, and his eyes, if eyes they may be called, were fixed on me. His jaws opened, and he muttered some inarticulate sounds. I took refuge in the courtyard, belonging to the house which I inhabited, where I remained during the rest of the night, walking up and down in the greatest agitation, listening attentively, catching, and fearing each sound as if it were to announce the approach of the demoniacal corpse to which I had so miserably given life. I passed the night wretchedly. I felt the bitterness of disappointment, dreams that had been my food and pleasant rest for so long a space were now become a hell to me. Morning, dismal and wet, at length dawned, and discovered to my sleepless and aching eyes the church of Ingolstadt, its white steeple and clock which indicated the sixth hour. I issued into the streets, pacing them with quick steps, as if I sought to avoid the wretch whom I feared every turning of the street would present to my view. I did not dare return to the apartment which I inhabited. Like one who, on a lonely road, doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round, walks on, and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. My dear Frankenstein, how glad I am to see you! How fortunate that you should be here at the very moment of my alighting. I grasped Henry Clerval's hand, and in a moment forgot my horror and misfortune. I felt suddenly, and for the first time during many months, calm and serene joy. I welcomed my friend, therefore, in the most cordial manner, and we walked towards my college. It gives me the greatest delight to see you. But tell me how you left my father, brothers, and Elizabeth. Very well, and very happy, only a little uneasy that they hear from you so seldom. But, my dear Frankenstein, I did not before remark how very ill you appear, so thin and pale. 
I have lately been so deeply engaged in one occupation that I have not allowed myself sufficient rest, as you see. But I hope, I sincerely hope, that all these employments are now at an end and that I am at length free. I trembled excessively. I could not endure to think of, and far less to allude to, the occurrences of the preceding night. The thought made me shiver that the creature whom I had left in my apartment might still be there, alive and walking about. I dreaded to behold this monster, but I feared still more that Henry should see him. I darted up towards my own room. My hand was already on the lock of the door before I recollected myself. I then paused, and a cold shivering came over me. I threw the door forcibly open, but nothing appeared. The apartment was empty. I could hardly believe that so great a good fortune could have befallen me. We ascended into my room. I was unable to contain myself. Clairval saw a wildness in my eyes for which he could not account, and my loud, unrestrained, heartless laughter frightened and astonished him. My dear Victor, what for God's sake is the matter? Do not laugh in that manner. How ill you are. Oh, save me. Save me. This was the commencement of a nervous fever, which confined me for several months. During all that time, Henry was my only nurse. The form of the monster on whom I had bestowed existence was forever before my eyes, and I raved incessantly.